again on behalf of the welcome the distinguished speakers on focusing on mathematical models and analysis of covid 19 we have with us professor edwin from the university of technology in germany professor uh, tail from uh, poland uh, our own uh, you know army sr srinivas rao uh, he is from the united states of america georgia and uh, i i understand that these may be in our is happening coordination of professor mati who is here and thank you very much for joining hands sir i am i'm given to understand that uh, this webinar has received participation of more than 39 countries more than 5000 plus participants or attendees the webinar and i understand that uh, we at the same time everything has a value but when we talk about cost and value trade off i i believe whatever that we think i i believe there is a logic behind it and uh, i i i i don't think uh, uh, we can think of life uh, this uh, webinar on uh, mathematical modeling i i believe uh, one of the uh, institution which has joined uh, this webinar is institute of interdisciplinary studies at the maharaja sahaj rao university of baroda uh, we really are trying very hard, you know and uh, this, this is the first of its kind because office of international affairs the department of mathematics science department of statistics department of applied mathematics and uh, various other uh, you know university for all of us uh, if we look at this mathematic modeling um, uh, i i believe as i said that you can't think of life without mathematics a lot of interdisciplinary studies research projects which are now happening if you look, look at mathematical modeling of biological systems and processes which I, which in itself is a growing field i am not a mathematician but i think uh, uh, these are some of the body of knowledge we are using mathematical and biological sciences which ranges from the organizational principles of individual cells to the dynamics of large populations the world is facing covid 9 for under risk estimate the contribution and the significance and the role that mathematical modeling is playing apart from that the new medical systems in the diverse areas like cellular biophysics regulatory networks development biology biomedical applications data analysis and statistics one very important area is epidemiology i think this is also big coming very very important you are talking about virology now that is neural systems in the brain i think think uh, again another area in which the mathematics modeling is playing very you know that uh, mathematical modeling has a lot of role think therefore i come congratulate uh, professor danesh patel and the entire team of office of international affairs that you have identified an area on which different experts uh, i would rather say stalwarts from across the world and we have the participation as i said from more than 39 countries i i i, I think uh, uh, it, 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 this is going to offer a very theme of mathematical modeling so many mathematicians across the world and i think uh, they would be having very interesting uh, deliberations on diverse areas before i 
क्लोज आई थिंक टू थिंग्स अबाउट दी महाराजा सहजीराव यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ बड़ौदा लेट मी टेल यू दिस यूनिवर्सिटी हैज इट्स रूट इन 1881 द यूनिवर्सिटी वाज सेट अप इन 1940 इट्स इट इज इट इज दैट बिग इन साइज इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट्स एकेडमिक रीच एंड इट्स एकेडमिक ऑफरिंग we have 45000 plus students where they come here and then they pursue their uh, you know research they pursue their education they put efforts to realize their dream in the maharaja sahajirav university of baroda it's a residential university at the same time uh, i believe rating and ranking has become extremely important dr vanisa she shared some of the you know uh, achievements of the university but let me tell you uh, that the h index of our university is 90 uh, we have uh, you know worked on about how must appreciate uh, the efforts put in by my faculties in the university we could mobilize 156 crores in last 3 years as far as the funding from research projects and we got about 104 crores in last 3 years in form of sponsored research projects the university has mobilized about 170 crores uh, from consultancy in last 3 years and consultancy project is around 8 crore plus we in fact on an average produce we have faculty of social work and uh, let me again reiterate that we have faculty of science uh, professor hari bhai is with us we promote fundamental research that's a major hub and uh, we also have faculty of technology and engineering where we in fact have department of applied mathematics applied chemistry applied physics applied research fundamental research we just scope for application oriented research if students they want to move and we are looking for collaborations uh, because i understand that um, um, if we really want to you know uh, carry out uh, uh, and which would be impactful i i believe the only option that we have is it has to be collaborative so i am very happy uh, that uh, the office of international affairs uh, you know which is primarily uh, is the uh, um, uh, arrangement or the office that we have set up to uh, you know um, uh, at uh, you know reach out to the students in uh, you know not just nationally but globally and i'm very happy professor dhanesh patel is playing key role in internationalization of higher education by uh, you know attracting students we have uh, international students from more than 14 countries and i think sir vanisa namyar uh, i uh, i uh, i am sure that these two day international webinar they are participating course on a very very important topic of uh, you know mathematical modeling and its interdisciplinary disciplinarity with the trends that are likely to happen in near future where mathematics is such a subject which i think has uh, which plays its role in in all other disciplines and probably it serves as a hub uh, i i uh, congratulate Congratulate uh, the entire team of the Maharaja Sahajirav University of Baroda, and convey my best wishes to each one of you. And thank you very much for a very patient listening. Thank you, thank you, one and all, uh, for the support to the Maharaja Sahajirav University of Baroda. Over to you, Sir, Professor Dhanesh. Thank Dhanis you very Patel. much. Thank you so much. Yes. Will uh, Will. Yes. Will Skilders. Yes. Now you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Danesh. Uh, so before introducing the speaker, let me thank very much the International Office of BSU, uh, Danesh Patel, and also Mati Hailio for organizing yet another extremely interesting and timely webinar. Uh, two weeks ago, we had the successful webinar on challenges and frontiers in mathematics for industry. Now we will concentrate on COVID-19 and mathematics. So thanks to all who are making this possible. solving all the technical problems and inviting world renowned experts and thanks also to the honorable vice chancellor professor jaime alvias for his encouraging his
is a colleague of mine at in Eindhoven. Uh, Professor Edwin van der Heuvel, he obtained his degree in mathematics and statistics from the University of Amsterdam. And in 1996, he also obtained his PhD at this university. He was the head of the statistical department of Merck, Sharp and Dome from 2002 till 2010, and then became a professor in medical statistics at the Medical Center of the University of Groningen, which is is the most northern province of the Netherlands. In 2014, he joined Eindhoven University of Technology, where he is a professor of statistics, but also a vice dean for mathematics. And recently, he set up the new educational track for data science. In the past few months, the group of Professor van den Heuvel became rather famous as they published daily analysis of the numbers generated for COVID-19. And we are very happy that today he will speak to us about this exciting work. Uh, Professor Van Heuvel, dear Edwin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Will Schilders. And, and I'm also very happy that I was invited for this very interesting and very challenging and large, actually, uh, webinar with uh, a lot of different for having me. But let's not spend a lot of time on, uh, on um, making um, let's say, kind of a solicitations for uh, the presentation on COVID-19. Um, essentially, what we've tried to do, if we the world, and we are also trying to find out whether or not certain, in, uh, in, in let's say, interventions from, from governments, how this might that have affected that of, uh, people uh, which are listed here, uh, which is my small research team that is working constantly on COVID-19. Let me see if I can go to the next. So uh, I want to talk about uh, a few things. Uh, the health growth models, um, how these models were and how you can fit the models. and some of the issues of fitting these models when you talk about predictions, uh, about uh, infinite turning. Yeah? So when it, it, it increasingly gets worse, and at a certain moment, hopefully it gets somewhat better, and the growth of infections. And, and I would like to talk a little about a little bit about the models. No. Investigating the effect of uh, governmental effects started. It started in China, uh, where the first patient um, of 30. Uh, probably there is a uh, patient earlier, but this was a particular patient with certain uh, symptoms, uh, symptoms on the Disease was behind this, and at a certain moment, they they would actually be able to determine which nineteen uh, virus. And um, and when this people that have been in contact with the patients, and they try to find overview of some of the results um, that was published by the WHO. Oh, um, and the interesting fact that 1,800 teams of epidemiologists to essentially find the, those people that have been in contact. And the results that they actually had is that about tested uh, were essentially also so uh, affected with the virus. Context uh, tested and found. Um, and one of the other things they do in China is they have fever clinics, and these fever clinics come to the clinic with a fever, whether or not they have uh, the virus as well. And as you can see in some of the earlier data in the bottom here, the number of infected people is very limited. So this is the type of data that is kind of a 
for sampling. So it's not a random sampling what we think that we would like to have when we do sampling in statistics. Picture a sampling approach, how it can be used um, to actually model the data. Um, so yes, it's a kind of a fact that is in contact with others. Is this person if it has been in contact with other people well as i said it's not perfect it's not perfectly sent um in instant this takes in purpose samples for instance in the market and opinion research uh, and so that is where this is uh, not required well, if you think about some of the earlier problems on the corona, corona outbreak um, in London, many century, John Snow was the person who found it. And actually means uh, not everything is lost, although we might have wanted to have the data somewhat sampled. Differently, it's not all lost. To do is we we started to look at uh, um, the first model and the compartmental model that uh, says, okay, uh, there's a group of means they are, uh, they could be infected. And if they come in contact with an infected, and this particular system is a very simple system. And if you set up this particular compartment equation here, a differential equation that tells us about, um, well, to be determined by uh, the ones who are susceptible and the ones who are actually divided by M can be seen as an a priori probability that a person who is infected with, uh, the, with, the, with the virus is um, infected. Three parameters involved. M, which indicates the total maximum number of people that's going to be infected when time uh, progresses. There is a slope, beta, which tells us how far people are, are being affected. And there is this alpha, which is a kind of a turning point. That is the moment at which uh, things are slowly getting better. And that is essentially the time point at which the growth is halfway the total growth. If you straight that the three parameters, M, beta, and alpha, should satisfy this equation where I zero would be the number of infected when we started to analyze the data. Well, you can analyze this the particular model in different ways. One of the ways is to assume that the number of infected, this is the cumulative number of infections over time, so this number grows over time, is essentially this nonlinear function, this a logistic curve, plus some noise, it is for the Onyx Dimple model. Um, you can use uh, normality for the residuals. And then this model essentially estimates all three parameters, M, beta, and alpha, separately. Um, you can make this model somewhat more complicated by also including some kind of heterogeneity in the variance structure, where the variability in the beginning of the growth curve and a curve, which is represented here. depends on the number of infections from yesterday. So somehow you need to incorporate that. If you analyze the 30 Chinese provinces that we did in the beginning, that would be somewhere in uh, February, the curve was more or less complete. And we actually saw that the different provinces of the Chinese, uh, uh, of the Chinese uh, country uh, actually had different estimates of the parameters. So the parameters of the alpha, beta, and the things 
actually saw is that these curves actually fit fair. The stuffer holes curves fit fitted very well to these data of the problem. We also investigated whether or not the relationship between the alpha that the alpha could be described by as, a, as this function of the beta and m. And since we estimated the three parameters separately in the Verhulst and m, this particular value, and then study whether or not the correlation in between the estimate alpha itself and this fabricated uh, alpha, whether that correlation would be uh, strong enough. We had the independent residuals, homogeneity residuals. So I need to go back. Um, that's for the different uh, models where we also included heterogeneity and where we included autoregressive. Whatever we did, we demonstrated that this relationship didn't really work very well. So apparently, the model is much more complicated than the Verhulst. Now we we use a more complicated compartmental model where we have susceptible people that can change into an infected person, but this infected person is never going to be stay infected forever. This person might actually uh, recover, or uh, on the other hand, it could. Uh, this person could die. So this is kind of a removed age. You are going to be removed out of the equation. Uh, so this is a slightly more complicated model for this transition of bacteria or the virus. Um, but there is a kind of a set of equations again, differential equations um, that can tell the Verhulst model would fit to the number of infected uh, uh, people. And now the the number of infected is always the total number, so we are always studying the accumulative number of infections. So um, if you simulate and start estimating the maximum value, so here we're focusing on the M, then we can actually see here this is estimating the parameter M without any bias. But if you see in the beginning of the curve, we are far away from estimating the maximum. So when we start connecting data on this uh, virus in the beginning, it's very difficult to determine what the maximum number would be at the end of the spreading of the virus. However, if you correct for this particular uh, pattern that you just see, uh, we, if we know that we at a certain time point, this get reliable estimates when we are a about 40% of the curve, so 40% of the spread of the virus is, is known, that we could estimate the maximum value relatively good. Of course, we don't know exactly what calibration model we should use. So one of the things we did, we actually used the calibration models from the provinces of China. And these are the average curve. That is the mistake that you would get from estimating the provinces, and that is used for all of the countries to do prediction. Our Verhulst model shows here some of the predictions we did, short-term predictions uh, in a few days, what we predict. We compare it with the observed number and the ratio of the target and the further away from the horizontal line zero. We are sometimes more than 10% away from what we truly observed. And 80% of our predictions were within 5% of the true values. And for death, we are actually discussing uh, can we find the turning point um, from a uh, an exponential form format to a timing, but it starts to diminish. And we looked at two, uh, uh, let's say, monitoring studies and made it maximum that we actually did every day. 
percent, then we are over with the turning point. And when the difference is bigger, here we see uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so we see here March 30 red ball. This red dot tells us that this ratio of and at that moment we actually said that we would uh, we are actually over the difference of the alpha minus uh, t and l so there it's already started to do better we verified our approaches by looking at other countries at certain moment so we were doing much better at that. Um, and so it started to diminish the spread. However, we also saw that started with this uh, simple uh, uh, for Hulse model wasn't good at all with this because, and this is formulated again in the differential equation. The numbers, the function of, of the number of infection. We fit that with the Poisson distribution um, where we uh, number of previous infections. And here we see four provinces in the Netherlands, which would be the estimate of the model, is doing very well. And also, we can make better predictions, which is actually improved dramatically by in, in making the model more. Complicated station of the number of infections. This is data from our would tell us how much we are away from the problem to one. It would be the Hulse curve, and none of them are equal to one, but it India seems to be closest to it. And if you look at the uh, beta, which is uh, more quickly it spreads, and as you can see, more more compared to other countries, depending on what the type of data is used and how, how long the way is maybe the USA, where the number of beta is very high. And to just show you a little bit of how all these countries did, this is a, an overview. And in the bottom here, we see India percentage or a, it's a ratio from the number of people living in the country. And India is actually at the low side at this moment. Um, and also the number of deaths, um, is, as you can see here, uh, compared to some. One of living in India. Then quickly go to the effect of governmental intervention, in, interventions. So we actually yeah. took a much more complicated uh, compartmental model where we have a kind of a susceptibles. Then there we have the exposed people. They are exposed to the organisms, but they're not infected. We have, there's a kind of a delay kind before they become infected. Exposed to the organisms. <laughs> Um, the accumulated number has, so every day we so get a new number of people infected. Accumulated number has, so every day we get a new number of people infected. Netherlands, Italy, and Spain, and you can see that our model follows the data quite well. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of variation that we cannot explain. That probably has to do with also testing policies of how many people are tested. So if you look at the transition rate itself over time, we made a kind of a piecewise linear or piecewise constant profile. As you can see here, this horizontal level, the beta estimate is about 1.2. And then uh, at March 17, it dropped to about 0.9. And the box uh, indicates a confidence interval. And this is the profile that we estimated. From in certain uh, interventions. So, and we try to match whether these interventions would be aligned with the drop in the profile that gives us an understanding what type of measures would actually affect the contact rate um, that they tried 
to inter interfere or try to influence with these particular uh, measures. And what we concluded from the different countries, because we studied several countries, it's not easy to study all countries because it's not easy to find out what kind of measures are done for each of the countries. So we studied only a few countries and we made an overview of some of the measures that were actually influencing the, the, the change in the growth rate uh, for these different countries. And what we concluded from this, we concluded that the closing of schools and banning events seems to have a kind of a direct effect. Um, so that seems to immediately change to change the contact rate. The lockdown, so many countries went in a lockdown. People had to stay home, work from home. We couldn't go, uh, we couldn't go away anymore. This lockdown seems to have a more of a delayed effect. In some countries, it immediately changed. But in other countries, we needed police enforcement to actually uh, make this work. And one of the other things we saw with all, when all of these measures were taken, it looks like the restaurant uh, event of this uh, contact rate, of this growth rate. And contact rate, which is relatively small, uh, essentially meaning that it is contained, that the growth is under control, the spread is under control. We still see three groups, um, groups with Germany, Spain and Italy, uh, and the group with Belgium, the Netherlands and the UK, and Sweden seems to do not as good. Uh, and they also did not implement as many measures as some of the others. This is an estimate of how many people we think were tested of those who were infected. This is the percentage of people that were actually tested according to our model. So what we've learned from all of this is that analysis of this data is very complicated, it's not properly selected. We need to do a lot of additional analysis, I think, to get a good information about what info, a good idea about the information present in the data to make firm conclusions. It's a very complicated uh, approach, but I think we really need all kinds of data oriented approaches to make this um, analysis and all of these uh, studies that people do uh, make them sound. That ends my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Edwin, for this very nice uh, presentation. Um, there's a question on the, so so the parameters uh, of the models. Uh, I mean, some seem to converge to the same number, but uh, it still depends on the country. It seems. Does it depend on culture or maybe? Whether or not these uh, contact rates were also depending on, for instance, the density and maybe the mm -hmm. average age and the strong pattern that we might need to include more countries to see that. As a counter example, I think Iran is a relatively young country. Uh, but Iran also is not one and we couldn't really say it was age dependent. Uh, and as you look, for instance, computing somewhat worse than the Netherlands, well, the Netherlands is much more dense than Sweden. So it's very different uh, factors are, are that makes the difference yeah. between these okay. countries. Uh, other question is the at the end of your conclusion slide, you had a comment about yes, Leo I Ryman. Can. Can you um, so that I a think bit? Leo Ryman was a person who worked in industry for a long time and came back to uh, the university. Uh, I thought it was Berkeley. Uh, and then when he came back, he was surprised. He's, they seem to focus a lot on theory. They seem to focus a lot on models. And he was thinking about, well, we should do much more, more data driven. Uh, types how it's uh, at this moment is yeah, how it's uh, developing data is I think you need to look at this more from a data perspective apply a lot of different things to understand and what really from his papers uh, but I do think that we need to look at this data from different yeah. angles to understand what is going on. Okay, one final.
question, Edwin. Uh, there's a question from somebody on. Uh, it's not a song process. Can you say something about yeah, that? So uh, the lambda is the, the essentially the expected value. So we're assuming that the number of new infections, given the previous total number of infections that we already have, have um, is essentially this uh, Verhulst curve. So the lambda is the expected value from that. Uh, and it's a conditional analysis. So that's why you can include in the Poisson regression, you can just include implement the past into this lambda to get a good model okay well thanks very much uh, again for your nice talk and also for sticking to the, yes, I to the to. time <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. thank you very much uh, and mm -hmm. well i think to the uh, Person to oh. Thomas Götz. Ah, okay. At, at least what written in the. Thomas, are you here? Yes, I can hear oh, you too. So I can introduce. Yeah. Mathematics and has worked um, since then for many years on also um, and um, has um, well quite interesting um, results mostly on the analytics side um, but also um, special problems and um, yes he will speak today I will not steal your time, so I um, make it short and um, will just announce um, your lecture now about SIR models and parameter estimation for COVID-19 in Germany. Please, go on. Yeah, well, thanks very much, um, Till, for introducing me. And now I will try to do this screen sharing. Uh, No, screen sharing does not work. There is a problem. Okay. Now, now it comes. Now it comes. Okay. So, the estimation for COVID 19 in Germany. First of all, I would like to thank Danish and all the organizers in India for setting up this nice webinar. Okay. Um, the work that I'm presenting today is, well, not only my work, but work of a larger group. And here you see lots of names. And this is basically a joint work together also with the group University in Rotslav, together with colleagues uh, around Wolfgang Bock from the Technical University. Trier, Nalin Ganegoda from Sri Lanka, and several people uh, from Koblenz as well. So, um, what I will to Germany to get some background about where we are now with this pandemics, and then I will speak a little bit of, on our parameter estimation. So. This is saw in the previous talk from Angel. Um, we are directly starting with some, some small SIR type models. With, uh, we will use them on one hand for. Basically, the number of uh, tests since statistics they only show for you the 
huge number of dog figures so persons that are not and we try to use this as a eye detection ratio and then what we try to do is to since um, when you down that and what all this aims at is to reduce context in social and every day life context outside your household since the context within the families and so on this is something which you cannot uh, control and then i will speak a little bit about open what is the situation topic. Germany current situation this is the data that I got when okay. I was preparing the talk this was on the 13th 6th uh, 2020 uh, by that time we had 186,000 detected cases at around 4.7 uh, there are deaths, almost no undetected so 8,781 is close to the true number of uh, deaths that are related to this uh, are related to this uh, this average of people dying in Germany in the um, showed up in the statistics this year for April. And of course, this year's difference it matches very well. Ammonia and also approximately 50% report loss. So this is a little bit all the picture uh, showing the map of Germany and then the regional and, and geographical. You can see that uh, in the eastern part of general incidence is rather low. Compare this, you can explain that in the southern part of Germany, large lots of people went for skiing holidays to northern Italy, and all the uh, virus into Germany. Disney resorts were closed by mid of May and also in the with larger number of infections in the western part. This was due to, to some local festivals that were going up March, which also so, uh, triggered some super spreading events were spreading the virus to a uh, large number of second cases in Germany uh, as they are re reported by, by the uh, robot for uh, uh, monitoring the health situation and epidemic is German but I, I guess you can anticipate so these are reported every day the peak occurred at the end of six and a half thousand in rather interesting you will somehow always some peaks and then some the period of seven days the lows always on Sundays. Since then, I guess that the office, since lots of people are just not in the office and do not collect the data, and then these peaks 
cases that are missing cases from the weekend. So therefore, one to be get to get a more moving average of this, this um, data. These are the report by hundred uh, deaths on a single day, and if you compare now this this peak of of infections, you already see the delay. Already some hint at this match is quite well showing the first symptoms until uh, it's possible uh, fatal houses and uh, they you see that, that there is a elderly people so the older people get the more um, significant the risk for them. Yeah. Always indicate males, the red uh, uh, columns indicate female age groups. Well, they, there's no clear picture whether this uh, different by this is a big issue uh, for Germany too. So this was three weeks of tests were done on these four hundred. Hundred thousand tests positive, so approximately one percent of the test is positive, and a million tests. This might sound a lot, but still, it is at least from the reported testing capacity in Germany is is about one one million. From there, there is uh, still some unused test capacity. And one could do much better. And now there is the discussion when schools are getting opened. Uh, serious math tests inducted. But still, there, there is lots of room for improvement. So, and these are the positive Germany. So, I just want to highlight uh, two things. So, for example, these two, they are in the southern part of Germany, the dates, and there always occurs a peak, which is somehow in the second half of March, holidays in Austria and Italy, and there you see lots of positive tests, whereas if you compare it to parts in um, northern Germany, so lower Saxonia or Schleswig-Holstein close to the Danish border, where there were not that many people, because they didn't have holidays by that time, the number of positive tests that occur much lower and of you do also not see this clear peak structure uh, if you compare them. So this is a clear indicator uh, that there was some uh, either dies or with a uh, probability one minus mu recovers. And what you see in the official statistics as total cases, these are infected plus recovered plus the death ones. If you write them as ODEs, then you have here your infection rate beta, which can depend on T, depending on whether you include uh, governmental um, interventions or not. 
n is the total population. Okay, so this is our basic model. And what we try to estimate is, of course, this uh, unknown force of infection or transmission rate beta together with the lethality mu, so the probability that it in fact it dies, the incubation period theta and the recovery period gamma. This is something that you can get uh, rather good estimates from the uh, people in medicine already. And here is a little bit more complicated model that we're using where we are somehow uh, subdividing the infected compartment into a more fine grain structure. So there you have the untested cases. And then you have the asymptomatic cases. So people that are tested positive, but do not show any symptoms or only very mild symptoms, they might get quarantined with a certain probability. And then you have the more severe cases, either still with rather moderate symptoms, so under medical treatment, and then the uh, severe cases that are in intensive care and that do need breathing support and so on. And when it comes to um, models and predictions on how well will the health system of a country cope with these pandemics, one key issue is always the number of available uh, ICU beds and breathing support machines. So the important compartment here is this eye compartment, which you should take into account since, frankly speaking, lots of asymptomatic cases which do not show any symptoms, do not put any pressure on the health system. So this is something that you can cope with quite well, but the intensive care patients, they are the ones that are the severe issues. Okay, and this would be a resulting uh, ODE system. Okay, so now in order to estimate the dark figure for that model, we um, modified the basic model to in take into account this time delay here between infection or infectious period uh, state and um, when the person how dies. Well so there is the health time delay of a country now? cope with this and pandemic. From what you saw just from One the uh, key first issue is always the from number the, uh, of available uh, institutes uh, uh, the peak between the maximum infections and the peak between the maximum deaths was about eight to nine days, then you can already anticipate that there, this time delay will be at the same order of magnitude. Okay, so this is the basic model. And this is, these are the results that we did. So the red circles show the official statistics reported from 1st of March onwards, since this was the day when in Germany we exceeded um, 100 officially uh, test, uh, registered uh, COVID-19 cases until um, end of May. And this is our model. So this is this solid line, which matches quite well. And this is the same uh, thing for the just taking into time count the death cases. So you compare the model, which is the solid line with the registered death cases. For the um, transmission rate beta, we assume similar to the previous talk, also a piecewise constant structure. And this somehow when these uh, values change, this depends on the governmental um, intervention. So before 16th of March, there were no interventions at all. So basically you had a free spread of the disease. Then on 16th, um, schools were closed. On 22nd of March, a further contact ban was announced. So we didn't have a real curfew, but just a contact ban. So you were just allowed to meet with one other person not coming from the same household. And then on 20th of April, we already started relaxing the um, measures. Since then, partly uh, some shops were again opened 
and um, schools were starting to open again. And what you can see is somehow the values for beta. So basically from before any governmental measures, this was around 0 0.6. Then at the interventions, it was dropping to 0 0.09. Well, this is basically a reduction by a factor six, which means if you would translate it from the social context that you have, which can contribute to spreading the disease, only um, one sixth of the contacts were still active. So only 16% of your prior contacts you were keeping at that could contribute to the spread of the disease. Interesting enough, even after relaxing some of the measures, the, uh, the contact rate remained rather small, same order of magnitude, not significant, no significant big difference. And this can be explained that even though more shops were opening, people were still uh, taking lots of care, social distancing and wearing a mask and so on. So this contributed to still keeping this transmission rate low. This Delta was our uh, detection ratio. So how many of the infected and recovered cases actually show up in the statistics and here we got that this uh, delta is around 0 0.23. This means only 23% of the true infections are tested and show up in the statistics, which means the true number of infections could be higher by a factor, easily by a factor of four. So which means right now we have around 200,000 infections. So the true number of infections could be easily at around order of magnitude of 800,000. Lethality was estimated to be 1.5%. Uh, 1.5% again, based on the total number of infections. And if you take into account that only um, one fourth of the infections actually uh, gets tested, appears in the statistics, then this matches again with this approximately 5% of dead cases that are seen in the uh, statistics from the Robert Koch Institute. And tau was our time delay between the uh, infection and the death. And this one was estimated to be a little bit more than 10 days. So this was based on uh, using a joint equations for the uh, ODE model. We did something similar with uh, some stochastic method with a metropolis algorithm and the order or the parameters that you get are in the order of magnitude approximately the same. Again, here uh, in red, the reported cases in blue, our estimates. So the models uh, predict quite well what happened in the past. Also, you can compute now from the um, models, the reproductive number. And this is now how this R0 was changing. And somehow currently this was state of uh, the weekend. The Robert Koch Institute was now reporting for Germany a reproductive number of 1.02 with a 95% confidence interval between uh, 0 0.82 and 1.3. And our models give you something which is significantly less than one right now. And with this uh, daily reproductive number that is reported by the Robert Koch Institute, this is always, of course, uh, subject to, or rather volatile since the, as you saw, the number of registered cases uh, shows these peaks in the middle of the week and lower numbers over the weekend. And then there, there's always uh, some fluctuation going on. But right now, the reproductive number is uh, somehow contained below one, which means that we have somehow suppressed the disease. But I guess Till will tell more about that in the next talk. So now I should come to the end. Just shortly, something about 
including the household structure. And then we did some comparisons between models for Germany and for Sri Lanka. In Germany, um, the, official, the average household size is 2.1 persons. In Sri Lanka, it's almost twice as large. And then we assumed that around 100 households form a community where you have a higher transmission within this community, just in, to take into account that um, you have some sort of your neighborhood where you spend most of your time and within this neighborhood you have a higher risk of getting infected or transmitting the infection. Whereas for the rest of the uh, population, then you are in less risk. And then um, we just did this comparison. Um, here are just the results for Germany. So what you see are the model and the data for the active cases. So the, the black one is the data for the active uh, cases in the infection. Um, the blue ones are our model simulation, as well as for the deaths. The red one are the, is the model, the black one are the reported data. And this is again the um, infection rate or the transmission rate. And again, we have used there this uh, piecewise constant um, functions where somehow in mid of May, there was a first set of restrictions announced reducing the beta and then a further reduction of beta. And again, you can see that the beta is reduced basically from a value around 0 0.5 to something around 0 0.1. So again, a factor of five by which the uh, contact contacts were reduced and also the um, transmission rate then reduced the or got reduced. Okay. So now since I should come to an end, um, I would like just to point out two open topics. Um, one important thing is somehow all the governments were very fast in announcing lockdown and measures for that. But then more crucial is the question, what are the ways out of the lockdown? So how can you relax the measures and relax them safely? What could be indicators for relaxing those measures? And when to tighten them again? The current strategy in Germany is that the measures got relaxed and you would locally tighten them if in a single district appear more than 50 new cases per 100,000 inhabitants within a time period of seven days. So there you have this threshold and if you exceed this threshold on a single district, then in this single district um, measures would be tightened again. And so far, there is no clear bound on how to relax them again. But you could think about a similar strategy saying if the number of cases drop below a certain threshold, then you could um, relax the measures again. Of course, this, this bound, this number of 50 per 100,000 infections, this is just a political number. There has been no uh, scientific uh, reasoning behind that one since this is a number that you can easily communicate. And there was the there is now the question, is this an optimal bound? What, should, what would be a reasonable bound? And of course, for that one, you would have to try to balance the economic loss due to the lockdown to the costs of the health system by uh, having many infections. And can you do a mathematical model for that? And well, this is currently under construction. We are working on that. But so far, I have not enough to tell you about this. So especially no results on that one yet to report. But we're uh, on the way to this and hope to get some reports in the next two, uh, some results in the next two weeks for such a model, which would then be some sort of an optimization model trying to find what are optimal bounds for this uh, relaxing and tightening the measures. And the other thing is the impact of school openings. As you heard in the previous talk, this has an important uh, effect and 
the question is, of course, since uh, in Germany, the full opening for schools is planned for mid June, so for right now or latest by mid of August. But of course, local outbreaks already occurred. And if you look, for example, in Israel, they had some super spreading events right now, and they think about closing schools again. So what would be a mathematical model that uh, takes into account what happens at schools, this, uh, where kids are under frequent contact and where the risk of transmission is significantly larger. And finally, what is completely forgotten in all these discussions is what is happening to universities. Everyone is discussing about opening schools, but opening universities is something that is not yet on the agenda. But this is also something that should be discussed. Okay, so much for that. And I think I have used my time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tomas, uh, Thomas, for the uh, very exciting talk. And uh, I have two, two panel questions. I would maybe quickly ask one question to you um, in, because you showed at the beginning that there is an inhomogeneity in the prevalence of detected cases across the age, especially at high age. And it's also known, of course, that the death rate and the severe progression is in higher age groups larger. So if you would um, differentiate your population with by age and would then, I mean, this is still in an ODE model. I mean, you get maybe a partial differential equation, but you still can incorporate it in a model if you put the age dependence of the death rates, um, say, in. Would you expect that this changes the dark figure estimate? The number of infections is higher by a factor of four matches with what you get from other sources where, where it's also believed to be something between factor three and factor six. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Thanks. In that sense, I would say, I, I would expect that it is in the same range. All right. All right. I have two short questions here from the panel. Um, one is how do your parameter values based on German hospitals compare with the rest of the world? Well, this could be your own talk. Um, and the second question is what about comorbidities? Uh, where are they recorded for detected cases? So for the comorb, so I start with the second question with the comorbidities. This is uh, not known to me whether they were um, reported or recorded. So at least I do not have the access to this data. And to the other question, so how do the results compare uh, to other countries? So what we try to do is somehow use our models also for comparing or for estimating the parameters um, for Italy and Spain. And for those countries, we do get larger numbers for the mortality, but this might be due to uh, the lower number of available ICU beds. So therefore, uh, lots of, well, cases, severe cases that survived in Germany might not have survived in other countries. But for the um, transmission rate and so on, you get similar mm -hmm. figures uh, okay. if you compare them to uh, Spain and Italy. Thank you. Um, I would allow one question from the panel here. Um, if somebody still has um, an important comment or question, please, now it's the time. If this is not the case, then I switch over in the um, chairman role, um, on the moderator role to Thomas and yeah. Okay, yeah, well, thanks very much Till for chairing my session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Till Kruger from the University of Wroclaw and well, I also do not want to uh, use your time, Till, but I just want to say that Till Kruger um, has the honor that he has initiated a large European initiative on modeling corona spread, the MOCOS group, 
which originated in Wroclaw, then, sp well, spread to Germany, so to, to uh, groups in Kaiserslautern, in uh, Koblenz, in Trier. Then there are also now uh, parts in the Philippines and in Sri Lanka. And he's an expert in stochastic modeling. And I guess till you will speak about microstructure simulations. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And yes, indeed, I will uh, speak about micro simulations. So let me just see if everything is well visible here. Can you see my frame? Yes. All right. So um, the topic is um, of my talk is insights from a micro simulation model not in the sense how good it fits to, um, uh, to actually data, say from Germany or Poland, which I could give such a talk because we're doing this kind of things, but I would like to concentrate here on um, the effect really on the phase transition and the improvement of the situation by um, extensive testing strategies followed up with quarantine and especially contact tracing and not only the classical contact tracing, but also the impact of the um, now upcoming um, tracking app on smartphones. And um, so as uh, Thomas already said, uh, the MOCOS group is an international group of researchers. MOCOS stands for modeling coronavirus spread. And um, it was founded in Poland, but now has many team members. And um, you remind me that Sri Lanka, I forgot to put on here on my list but we have a large team in Poland. We have also a substantial team in Germany. Um, Thomas is a member of this and a large team in the Philippines. And because we are in India here, I put only the Indian members with full names on the uh, display. Um, so all of those groups sometimes also do a little bit independent, but we use basically the same core model and uh, program. And uh, there is a website, uh, mocos.pl, uh, uh, where you can um, see further information and also pre -prints. Good, so let me, that is on my topics. Um, I will first present um, the key features of this model and then say a few words about um, uh, what we call the outhousehold reproduction number and how it relates to what you know as a reproduction number and say a little bit also about the house role of household on the phase transitions in this epidemics and then coming to the uh, main point the impact of certain countermeasures um, be beyond the classical reduction of contacts which actually as a parameter all models have in but um, contact tracing is much more difficult to do if at all in differential equation models. So here micro models are relative, are really of use. And then I would also say something on the impact of the tracing of the smartphone app. And at the very end, if I have time, I would like to say some words, how we estimated a couple of parameters in the contact tracing, for instance, based on patient data from Poland. Um, and um, let's see how far I will come. Good. So I will, uh, I will not present the model in a really street, a re a rigorous mathematical ways um, because it would um, be a little bit too much time take me. And I think for the, uh, for the basic understanding, it's also at the, this level here not needed. So just the, the core, core information. It's an individual based model and um, the population we have here is based on realistic um, individual census data involving the household structure with all the correlations you have in the census data. So that means age, gender, um, professions and so on. Okay. And then we define somehow a random heterogeneous contact network where we look only actually at infectious contacts, which are implicitly defined by um, um, the real contacts um, for out household and inside the household. And uh, the progression of the disease within individuals is um, described by distributions. So not just by, by mean numbers and those distributions are updated or taken from the literature. In part, we estimated on our own data set for Poland on the patient data set. 
And then you can have still a coupling between the individuals depending on its type. For instance, people with different workplaces, um, with certain professions are more often linked to people with, work, with people which work in the same field. And you can make age correlations in, and this can be a very general functions. I keep for today's talk this function actually very simple and look only for the impact of the, um, of the duration of being infectious. Inside the household, the network is a clique, and um, time is in our model continuous. It's a continuous time process, so every infection event has, happens at a different time. And the time between consecutive infection is then sampled from a serial interval distribution, which involves incubation time and um, time staying outside the households, um, depending on the progression of the disease. And overall, this generates a directed random infection graph, which is a little bit a generalization of a class of heterogeneous random graphs invented by Bolobash, Janssen, Riordan in the uh, 15 years ago. And there is, despite the complexity, a relatively rich mathematical theory here behind, where we can compute a lot of things, phase transitions um, and prevalences, but it's um, relatively involved, and I will not spend any time today in my talk to speak about that. So let me a few words say about the house, out household reproduction number because it's an important control yes, parameter then in the from I will show interval distribution. Um, it's, we define it as the expected and, um, number of secondary cases generated by an individual condition that this individual um, depending on has the only contact the with the and overall and no this generates measure a directed a random okay. infection okay. graph. So the effective, the little bit of generalization number of outside the house is less than this because it F depends on countermeasures. So so is the person the, detected when uh, 15 years under ago quarantine and time or There is, despite the complexity. And um, I will present here um, how the, uh, the relative the shape or the fate of the epidemic changes if, um, as a function so the effect reduction factor of the generalization of outside the house is out house less than this estimated F depends on the on basis of, of the initial growth of the infection of years years ago, ago, and, and there is essentially the and, um, and um, I will present here uh, secondary um, cases how the outside uh, relative shape of the changes in Poland as a function of the effect reduction factor of the generalization that the out household reproduction number would be 1.5 essentially. Good. So households are very important in this epidemics, and this is just a fact here. Um, as you this is a molar plot, the relative share of infections in Poland. And what you see in the pink, um, the pink area here is, um, is um, the lower pink area is the fraction of household infections on all infections which were discovered. And this is more or less a third, a little bit between a third and 40%. So it's a considerable fraction of the infection going on in the household. And uh, Tomas already say, whatever you do in that contact reduction, it hasn't it, it cannot affect the household. So um, you can imagine a situation that uh, the left um, upper picture is um, a link structure where a link represents a potential infectious contact if one of the green nodes would be infected. And here, this structure would imply that the infection would not spread. It stays localized in the small connected components. Now, the dashed line on the right upper picture would somehow represent now that you pair people or group people according to households. And um, so the circled parts are now the household. And the household dashed lines, you can't really kill by countermeasures, whatever you do. You can put the household under quarantine, but it is still going on. And what you finally have to understand is really the network structure on the red graph on the lower right part, which is the connection between the households. And um, assuming that um, one in infection appears in the household, um, it could potentially infect a large fraction in the household, depends on the attack rate, of course, but still 
depending on that, you still have to understand this household infection uh, the, between households. And here comes now an interesting part, just by the construction of the model, that if you look on the probability, for instance, that a household, a single household, is in contact with another single household, that's a certain number, depending maybe on the parameters of this person. But if you have a three-person household and a four-person household, the number of possible contacts between them, so the a priori probability that the infection jumps from the one household to the other one, is scaled up by the product of this uh, household sizes. This implies a preferential att attachment structure in the household graph, the red one. And if you have preferential attachment in the network, in an F which describes infectious process, then not only the mean number are relevant, but also variances or other uh, features of the distribution. I will not go further into this. I just want to motivate here that households are important. And you can see the impact of that if you look at the phase transition. This is a theoretical computation with um, population um, without households, so a simple SER model. And um, uh, again, the F factor is a reduction compared to the initial value zero point something. And the, the orange line is the classical phase transition and then the end prevalence, uh, which you would get also from a classical SER model. Um, SAER model actually, and the blue line is um, the impact of the household. And you see that the phase transition is much lower, but especially it's much more steep. And that is what we see all over um, our simulations actually. So um, this was only a reduction here of, um, of the contact structure. Let us see now the first countermeasure, which is uh, testing uncovering people by extensive testing, and then um, putting the household under quarantine. No contact tracing yet. What you see here in the upper panel of these two red pictures, red-blue pictures, is the end prevalence, um, which you obtain if you specify the probability of finding a mild case versus the contact reduction. So the contact reduction corresponds to out-household reproduction number, which is then less than three. And you can see two things. First of all, increasing testing, um, that means you the probability to find a mild case, we always assume that household cases were found, is improving the situation very much in the sense that the phase transition, which is the blue-yellow line, essentially shifts very much to the right. And you see also how steep the phase transition is. If you pass a little bit to the right from the yellow-blue line, the phase transition, um, into the supercritical epidemics, you very quickly go to very high number, despite um, the quarantining and the household. The below part is the waiting time till the end of the epidemics, which is obviously the longest if you are at the critical line, because you have essentially constant increments. Good. Um, now, let me come to improving this um, just testing and quarantining by um, adding contact tracing. So contact tracing is, in our model, contains essentially two parameters. The probability, if you start from an index patient, patient which you have found, to uncover one of its infectious contacts. This could be either the parent node either the parent node um, or um, a person which this index person infected. So this has a probability to uncover such a link, and this we call B. And then you have a time, how long it takes from finding an un in, in a link person to, for, to the index person, person to take a test and putting him um, to get the positive result and putting the person under quarantine. And what you see here, um, Depending on the tracking probability, um, the timing matters very much. If the delay is four days, it has almost no impact on the progression of the epidemics. If it's one day, the impact is very much, especially at higher tracking probabilities. Um, now, this is a little bit understandable because you can see that contact tracing as a healing <coughs> epidemics running behind the true epidemics. And if this speed of this healing epidemic somehow is at the same order, 
as um, the true epidemics, it, you will actually see no effect. Good. So this was uh, without quarantine, the detected cases here appear only from hospitals. Um, now, if you add um, detected mild cases, the situation can improve very much. You see it on the right. That is very fast tracking, half a day. And if you go for the Polish data, for instance, we estimated out of patients that the detection rate of mild cases by testing strategy is at the moment about 30%. And the mean delay time is two days um, between onset of symptoms and finding the person um, uh, till in the quarantining, uh, but also um, the mean delay time in terms of, um, of, um, Of, oh, sorry, this is not yet the contact tracing here. This is still the uh, probability of detection. And I thought I have shown this. Anyway, I wanted to show this, but I think I have the wrong picture. Um, maybe put here. Anyway, improving um, the, the tracking. So starting with more cases in the contact tracing is a very helpful thing which you should do. OK. So. Um, let me go here further. And then you now can look at various combinations of um, contact probability versus um, detection rate of cases. And um, here, this picture um, shows that there's essentially a linear relation um, between B and the detection rate by the, by the testing, um, which defines the critical line to so the line of the phase test. Good. Um, this is a little bit more picture, and um, this is still um, another combination, uh, fixed tracking probability and um, the detection rate Q. Again, you can see here of how much it buys you, how much it buys you to increase, uh, to use all your testing capacity uh, which you have. Let me come to the very much discussed in the news now um, tracking um, tracing app. Um, so the app um, is uh, very much the use, the, the, the meaning or the, somehow the, the importance of this app depends very much on the fraction of users. This is denoted here U. And uh, the baseline for the classical tracking was here assumed the success rate of 60%, which is Polish, uh, based on Polish data. And the classical tracking has a delay time of two days. And the app tracking would improve the tracking times because you still have to take a test and you have to contact the person by half a day, but the success rate would be warm. But what you see is, um, is uh, for different detection rates, so maybe concentrate on the left lower picture, is that for um, prevalences of this tracking app, so user, uh, usage coverage, by less than 20%, it has almost zero effect. And that is, of course, due to the fact that you need two people to use the app to be actually successful. And that's why the probability to find such a link then goes like u to the square. So if you have say 10% in the population of users, you would detect one among 100 um, in new infections out of this tracking app, a very low number. So you have to go to high numbers, but then it becomes extremely efficient. So South Asian, uh, Asian countries, especially Korea, um, and Singapore have a high very usage uh, frequency of this app and they can do very well almost reducing the outside household contacts um, to a level before the epidemics. This is the timing. I will skip this a little bit, but I wanted to say still a few words how we estimate, how you can estimate the parameters um, for the tracking, um, classical tracking success rate and the duration, say, and the success rate or the, the probability to find a contact via testing strategy. So in Poland, we have access to patient data and they are linked. Um, so what you get is finally clusters of patients where you still have additional information about in which context the infection happened, whether it was household or workplace or healthcare, et cetera. Then you get such kind of clusters of connected, of linked patients. Now, what you do is you look for the first detected uh, patient in this cluster. 
this is usually the source where, um, where a tracking process started. And um, first you can look on how many of these initial found persons in these clusters were found because they went to the hospital or not to the hospital. And from this ratio, you can estimate how large is the likelihood to find a person with mild symptoms. Second thing is, you can look if the first detected person in such a cluster, the parent node was found. This is the backward tracking probability. And then you have a forward tracking probability, but modulated by the uh, mean house, by the out household reproduction number. So you see only the product of our star times the forward tracking probability as the number of cases you detect from an index person, which is the first detected person in this cluster here, um, which he eventually has infected and which have been found. And now you get, um, you can plot these things in this BF um, graph here. These are the dashed lines. Um, look for the purple line. This is essentially taking all the cases into account. And then you can still um, estimate where on the case that, on the case numbers here for Poland, for instance, we are most likely in this parameter frame of B versus contact reduction, um, the epidemics is. So this is just, I mean, we look for likelihood. We, this is based on about uh, 400,000 sample paths generated for all these combinations of parameter pairs making distributions and over uh, the sample path, um, yeah, essentially define a measure on the sample path and then estimate the likelihood that the true epidemics is there. And this are where the stars and the blue parts are. And you see the match point where the dashed line cross um, is also where our one of our likelihood points is. This has two implications. First of all, the backward and the forward tracking probabilities are essentially the same. And you estimate also, you get the numbers. You get it more or less to a value of 55% uh, success rate, 60% maybe. And you see also that at that time in Poland, this was um, middle of, well, second half of April, we had about 60% reduction compared to the previous situation. So these are things you can do. And um, in the conclusions, I would really recommend um, if you do contact tracing in your country, do it fast. The time matters. You have to try to go be, be below one day. This is really, then the things um, are really very efficient. Um, the success rate you can improve, especially by mobile, um, by, yeah, I will buy it, uh, looking on mobile data and really who was there if this state has access to GPS, but in Europe, this is not possible. It's violating privacy. But if you use an, an app, then uh, a, long, a large number of people sh um, should have used it. Otherwise, it's relatively useless. Extensive testing is very good. Use your full capacity, but still from all this measure, the social distancing still is the strongest one. And um, do not counter measures uh, uh, to, to stop countermeasures too early, wait till the cases are essentially at zero. So that would be my recommendation here. Um, there is um, a lot to say on the maths. We have actually recently also succeeded to analyze the backtracking as uh, really in a mathematical description, but I have no time to speak about this. And I think for the moment I should stop. I'm a little bit overdue with my time maybe, but not very much. I'm almost, yeah, almost 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Till, for this very interesting talk. And um, still, I have some problems of finding questions, but until I have found them, maybe one first question. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit what you did on this um, contact tracing? So how many steps do you go back, basically, if I'm now, let's say, tested positive, do you just test my contacts or also the contacts of my contacts? Well, um, you know, you go also the contacts of my contact. The thing goes as far, and this is the way also how we model is. You get found. Now you get interviewed and the people will um, ask about um, which people you can tell them uh, you had close contacts with. All those people go usually under quarantine. 
irrespectively whether they have um, been, will be positively tested on them. So this is after detection, you put those people under quarantine and then um, you look whether the person has eventually symptoms or not. And if the person has symptoms, um, then you take a test. And after the positive test result, and that's the way how in all countries is actually going, you start to define this new case as an index patient and continue the track. So you go on. And it also, you do it with the parent node. If you find the source of your infection and the source has, I mean, symptoms or will the source then will be tested? I mean, you don't know the source. I mean, you just can ask, did the symptoms appear earlier and is the person already sick for some time? Then you test the person and then you again, once whatever person you detect in the cascade of this tracking is defining a new continuation of the tracking. So it goes forward and backward. Um, but of course, um, it will in practice not go, I think, more than two steps backwards, I would say. We don't observe much cases here with, um, with more than two, right? Two is still possible, but it's already relatively rare. So you go usually back one step and then from that case, eventually still forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the simulation, we have not limited the number of steps you go back. So in principle, you could, if you, the tracking probability would be one, you would eventually go to the source of the whole infection in the country or in the cluster in which you, in the connected component you are, and then go from there on forward, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and at least you would then find um, if the speed is not too slow, so if you catch up with the, with the front, you would could effectively find everybody. But um, this is idealized, of course, under the assumption that the tracking probability is one, which is, so I would maybe say one word here. The tracking, you, what you can find in classical tracking, so without using the app, is essentially your family members you had contacts with, your friends, your workplaces, and people you know. The sporadic contracts, it means people you eventually infect in public transport or in shops, etc you can't find because you just don't know those people and you cannot retrieve this from an interview. So that's why the masks veering precisely at that places is crucial. So you should really, tr that's the only tool you have to prevent this type of infection. The other ones you can eventually deal with, okay? Okay. So thanks very much. And unfortunately, I do not get any news here on the question section since the last um ah there's one yeah there's the question can one use this simulation to predict the common of infection for years uh this question this i do not really fully understand yeah me too what is the common of infection for years um so this does not help. I do not understand. Maybe there is a typo, but okay. Maybe I can ask the, the person who posed this question to uh, rephrase it a little bit. Okay. Good. Um, okay. I have to um, stop. Okay. I will. I already but, stopped. Yeah, I'm still already stopped screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But um, please comment on local mobile data versus global mobile data and contact tracing. I guess this refers to the question where this data is stored. Maybe the difference yeah. between the apps in Germany and uh, France, for example. Well, I mean, in Poland here, um, I'm closely related, uh, closely involved in this developing in this app and also in the in the fine tuning. This is absolutely every data are private. Um, so you know only that you have uh, had a contact, you don't know when and where and you get a risk class classification. And then you can call up the health service. 
And only at the moment when you call up the health service, it's actually um, starting to, uh, then you get interviewed and then um, measures, quarantining and so on follow up. But it's up to you whether you contact the healthcare service. In Belgium, for instance, I had an interview with a backtracker, with a tracker in Belgium actually, and um, there the situation was a little bit strange. They only did forward tracking, but not backward tracking. So um, they didn't go um, to infections which were longer than two days ago. That means it's very unlikely that they find the parent node. Mm. Okay. Right. And um, the, I mean, some countries like China has, of course, complete um, access to your localization and they can do different things. But I mean, um, yeah. that's the way it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ah. And now there is the explanation of this question um, about the focus of contamination. Yeah, I mean, but, but for that, I would involve, need involve more structure. So this, I put here the model relatively simple and uh, to see just the effects of this countermeasures, understand the impact on the phase transition. This picture will not change. So the steepness of the phase transition you see you see how much it improves. And, um, and that was the, the focus here. Um, of course, you can predict where uh, the high risk uh, parts in, the, um, in a country are. Um, for instance, if you involve um, super spreading um, possible events like churches or so, it's possible to do in the model, but I don't have simulations for that right now here. Okay, thanks very much. Till for this very interesting talk on simulation, microstructure simulations. And now I will hand over back to Will for announcing the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, and thank you for the nice talks by you and also by Till. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker in the session before we start with the panel discussion. We are running a little bit over time, but uh, still want to introduce Professor Rao. Uh, he's a professor in the Division of Health, Economics and Modeling at the Department of Population Health Sciences and also the director at the Laboratory for Theory and Mathematical Modeling at the Medical College of Georgia in August, at Augusta University. Uh, until 2012, he held a permanent faculty position at the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, and he had taught or performed research at several institutions including the Indian Statistical Institute, the University of Oxford, Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru, uh, and also the University of Guelph in Canada, prior to his uh, arrival at Augusta University. So I would like to give you the floor, uh, Professor Rao. Uh, I think your talk has been scheduled for 35 minutes. I will warn you if necessary after about 32 minutes. Are you there, Professor Rao? I think he was online earlier. Danesh, can you help? Hello. Professor Rao, hello. Hello. I, I don't think he's there. <laughs> but he typed in in the comment that he is there. Um, so I just seen in the chat. Yes, that's right. Is he in the uh, yeah. in the Zoom? But he's there, sir. I mean, hello. Will he's, he's there? there. He is. Maybe he has mute his microphone. He's here. He's here. Hello. 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 Uh, maybe he's in the wrong session. He is not in the Zoom session. 
No, no, he's in the Zoom session, sir, yes. He's in the Zoom mm -hmm. session, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you type the questions? Uh, uh, Will, can you write a message to him again? He says if something is disabled for him. Yes, he also, he, yeah. He is going to log out and log in again. Okay. Hello, so this happened. Danesh, can you see whether he's online again or? Yeah, he's online, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I just uh, here, here I but do not see. I'm here but do not see. That's what he messages to me. Yeah. But do not see what to up, where to upload, yes. Just a minute, just a minute. Like you, Amrath? Maybe it would be possible to switch the last speaker to just exchange the speakers so here, give it a little bit more time for him um, to um, to clar clarify the technical issues. Yes, we, we can do that, but uh, that's the panel discussion. So maybe. Uh, All right. Maybe uh, yeah. I, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I have see. I see. Yeah. No, we have no option. But, but maybe I mean, Mati had a few nice questions. I think so. Maybe we can ask the speakers that are still online. Uh, Mati, would you like to uh, to kick off? Oh yes, yes. Uh, we can start now. Use the remain remaining time for the panel discussion. And if this last speaker will show up, then we can switch back to 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 him again. Yes. Then, as you can try to to, to reach the. Yes, 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 yes. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, for. All those speakers who are still on online, uh, I would like to uh, ask some uh, simple questions. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, what do you see as the most crucial issues in your country and the present situation of COVID right, uh, virus right now? And if 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 this uh, question did not uh, raise any any answers, the next question is, how do you evaluate now the, the talks that we have heard, which would be now let's say the main. Um, uh, Hello? Maybe the national uh, uh, Yeah. Please go ahead, Mati. So was was there a response? I, I did not I did not hear what the speaker says. Was it anyway? The, the next question would be what would you see as the main message, the main take-home points from those talks that we have heard so far? What, which interesting things you you, uh, you observed and found out? 
But maybe I still have a comment because the first question we are somehow um, uh, um, was a little bit silenced because you had to sort maybe your brain um, every, to come up with an answer. So I tried to say something for the Polish situation. Poland okay. is, is in a certain sense an ex, a little bit an exceptional country because we are traveling since um, essentially since um, April. Um, on the critical line. So we have constant increments. And um, uh, this is a, a very unusual thing. If you look for the 200 countries which are affected in, in the world, almost no country shows such a picture, except those where you know that the numbers are cooked, um, like maybe in, in, in Belarus um, or something like that. I will not be um, say as... But there are some numbers where you ha can have doubts on the things. But um, in Poland, uh, the numbers are truly the numbers they know. And um, they are very much on the critical line. Now, there is since uh, three weeks uh, a slow, um, the, 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 the reductions, the restrictions were loosed. And you might wonder if you're on the critical line and you lose the restrictions, then you should go up in the overcritical domain and you should get growing numbers. But this is not the case. And uh, my explanation for that, that it was a little bit by luck compensated by a relatively strong increase in the testing coverage. So Poland has more than doubled the success rate of finding people with mild symptoms. And that was evidently compensating to a large amount of this, but has never brought it uh, into a subcritical domain. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, with the ongoing fervor um, time to come um, that we will maybe go over critical. Um, the tracking app we have now installed here is only very little used. It's less than 1%, which means nothing in terms of fighting the epidemics. Um, this can maybe a little bit improved. Um, what is... Um, in another problem here, we have a large number in the data sets of uh, people which are formerly still in the hospital. If you look for the number of recovered patients, Poland is monotonically increasing, which means essentially that recovering is not reported. And um, the, so we have a lot of people staying in the hospital, but truly are not longer in the hospital. And this is certainly a problem when you interpret data. Um, so that is one of the prop specific problems here in Poland. Um, just to answer something on your question. Okay, thank you. Now in the chat box, there are now some questions appearing there. Uh, I think this is now for all the speakers. If anyone has something to say, uh, uh, sir, we are doing COVID-19 data extrapolations for Vadodara city. Can you suggest appropriate methods? Appropriate methods for data extrapolations for a big city like Vadodra? Well, what I could add is if you want, if one wants to do data extrapolation or basically prediction, whether it's a city or a district or a state in India, I would suggest first to start with some hierarchy of SIR type model. So basically starting from the simple ones that, that you already saw and then making the model more com complicated. But this would be for me, the, I think the first starting point to do simulations. Since the microstructure simulations like TIL presented them, they are rather complicated to set up. That's right. This takes uh, quite a bit of time. And then you have to do um, also to make very efficient programming. I mean, we can do now, say, for 38, for 40 million people um, running, say, 100,000 um, sample path simulations till the end of the epidemic, say, till for a few years within a few hours. But this is really, um, it's not so easy to get to this kind of, um, of simulation efficiency. And uh, it's From certainly, simple ones if that, you want that something you already quick, saw, then it's not so easy to do. It offers you a lot in terms of involving the, contact tracing and um, detailed insights. 
But for the data, for the question here, data exploration, it depends, I mean, what data you can get. If you get individual patient data, then of course it's optimal. Then you can do a lot Point. and you do can, um, then I would go for a micro model Since because you can feed the results in. If you like have only um, them, accumulated data, you should start with uh, certainly something simple. That's right. This takes um, uh, quite a bit of time. You can still also do micro simulations much I mean, more data simple you than can get. If you get individual um, patient um, data, then so of it's course it's somehow a continuum between very complex simulations. Then I would go for a micro model because you can feed the results. If you have only accumulated data, you should start certainly something simple. That's right. You can still also do micro simulations. You can you can do More simple micro you get, micro simulation you get, um, well, um, data that, or which somehow contain the features which also differential equations model uh, contain and then you can do a couple of things like individual quarantining and maybe a little bit more heterogeneity in the population especially. Um, super spreading events uh, that you can include easily, I would say. Okay, then there is one interesting question about uh, geographic information systems, I read the question. What about the simulation of the geographic propagation inside a region or a city supported by a GIS? I can maybe also say something. I mean, in principle, the type of model we use here, this is, you can just add a geotag. Um, you know somehow where the people live if you have census data. We have another group in Poland here, which very much focusing on this geographical aspects, and they have also involved um, transport, um, transport data, so com mobility data, which uh, in part come also from Google and Apple um, on the exchange between different parts of the region, and then you can build up a geographic, um, a geographic uh, model. As long as, and especially to answer also the question Thomas raised at the end of his talk with this regional lockdown, um, what is the right number there to do and how long it should last? Uh, for that, you need actually a geographical model to simulate this and to get um, some answers out of this. For that, it's really useful. Um, so um, it's doable, but it's still adding another level of complexity. Okay. Right. Thank you. I go on with the list of questions. There is a nice questions on, on the chat box. The uh, one next question is about the general accuracy of uh, the uh, these uh, models. So uh, the next question is, can we predict the controlling of the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic on the basis of these models and, and how would you comment on the general accuracy of these methods that, that we are now talking about? Um, well, regarding accuracy, first of all, the question is what, what does one mean by accurate? I mean, we still do not know the true number of infected cases. Right. And therefore, whether my model is accurate or not, I can only, um, somehow validated against the data, try to include some effects for estimating the number of, or this dark figure by saying maybe the, the number of deaths that are reported is rather, is more accurate than the number of reported cases. But if I'm also not sure about the true number of deaths, if I'm not sure about the true number of infections, then for me, it's, somehow the thing, yeah, I cannot judge accuracy since I do, if I do not have any data, which is commonly believed to be accurate against which I can validate my model. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, but on the other side, um, controlling in pandemic um, and to, and using in mathematical model, this is the, the aim from the very beginning, the first malaria models around 1900, were um, somehow developed to get an insight what you should do to fight the uh, the propagation of the disease. 
And uh, what you usually do, you try to estimate the parameters which fit to your present situation and then say how much I have to change the parameters that I get into the subcritical, in the good domain, in the, uh, the epidemic um, is not longer growing. So this is what, whatever model you use, you can always, it's a key question, I would say, in, in all models to uh, locate the phase transition and to see what is the best combination of measures, countermeasures to bring you below that. Sometimes it's only qualitative, you cannot be accurate, but still there is a sensitivity analysis. Tuning in some parameter might be much less effective than some other parameters. And that you can understand from a mathematical model, irrespectively uh, where the location, um, the accurate location right now is. So um, that's maybe in part an answer or an additional answer to what Thomas already said. Yeah, so there are so many uh, unknown uh, factors, unknown parameters, and so forth. So the accuracy is, is a big issue, and, and in general, we cannot be yeah. very. Yeah. Okay. Let's go, uh, but yeah, one point. The to, next. And um, just maybe to, to, to add one point the number of parameters which you really have an access to, so which you can do something is actually not so large. I mean, it's, um, this is much more limited, right? The medical parameters you can't change. Now, some of them are very unknown, but I mean, the things you really can change is contact reduction, maybe closing something, affecting the tail of the distribution, doing some um, detecting people putting on the quarantine. So it is a relatively limited set of parameters which describe things where you the the the, the state uh, health authorities actually okay, can okay okay so thank, thanks pr professor kruger and, and thomas now i interrupt this because it seems that now we have uh, professor rao online yes i uh, i think he's can online you... and i also saw him in the zoom session so welcome uh, professor rao to this uh, session uh, we are glad that it worked now we see your screen uh, just uh, quickly repeat the introduction then. So you're a professor in the uh, University of uh, Augusta in the US. Until 2012, Professor Rao held positions at the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. And he also taught uh, at several uh, institutions, for example, the Indian Statistical Institute, University of Oxford, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and also University of Guelph in Canada prior to his arrival in uh, Augusta. So I would like to quickly give you the floor, Professor Rao. Thank you, Professor Schindler. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Patel also for inviting me and uh, thank Professor Schindler for a nice introduction. And I'm very excited to speak for this um, session. And the title of my talk, as you see that, you know, the AI and uh, mathematical modeling. And uh, yeah, the organization of my talk, if you see that, I have a two sections. So one is on AI. Let me go to the presentation more. Yeah. So I will start with uh, the artificial intelligence model and then I will explain the, the mathematical modeling done for the nine countries uh, under reporting uh, analysis. So let me take out the panel. So right side of the panel is... Uh, okay, let me bring it to left side, okay. Yeah, first we have, you know, when the coronavirus started in China. And then in the middle of January, we see that, you know, in the US, there is a news that, you know, that will not come to US or if it comes, even then, even if it comes to US also, the preparation was very good. So we didn't actually look at the, 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 the spread models in the January. And then at the time I thought, you know, as a mathematical modeler, I have been developing on the various mathematical models for other diseases. Initiated, I initiated with the, uh, identification. We were only worried about the identification. You know, who is the right person to identify as a corona infected, uh, COVID infected uh, individual? Hence, you know, end of January, I developed a model using the artificial intelligence framework, 
with a mobile based survey to identify individuals who can be uh, who can be you know uh, who will have potential uh, coronavirus in their body or they don't have in their body that's what an identification we were worried about identifying right individuals in the beginning because the there is no clear symptoms uh, there are clear definition of symptoms in back in january there is no not much availability of the data and then uh, because i work i have uh, you know the my lab my ma- mathematical lab is in the medical college i asked you know once i developed the model i asked my clinical colleague he is an infectious disease uh, clinician joe asquez i requested him if he can uh, join me as a co-author so we both uh, published this paper article this is the first uh, mathematical i mean the first ai model anywhere in the world for identifying the coronavirus for uh, you know through the mobile based survey that's how this we entered into the coronavirus so i will start explaining the how that ai model works so in the first phase the model collects the data on the travel history of the individuals like symptoms where did they go what are the body symptoms all that information that uh, the model collects through an app and then once the information on the basic symptoms and the travel history and then uh, the signs their body all these things they are entered into the mobile phone that information is been transferred to the hospital system so this transfer you know the data collection stage and the model stage so before model is been implemented the data is collected through mobile phones and that information is transferred to the nearest uh, hospital system and uh, they the hospital system within a minute would ideally should re- respond to that individual whether they have a risk of coronavirus or not and then if they don't have still the machine still the model would respond to them and tell that you don't have any risk of coronavirus at that moment and they may have to repeat that you know that uh, mobile phone response maybe once in a week or once in a few days depending on if, how much the risk they are how much exposure they have and then the machine at the background at the hospital stage this machine would decide whether the individual has any symptoms or not and typically that individual responded would receive a some alert with a message with number or some you know some identity identification number which that individual carries to the nearest hospital where the message has come that you will proceed to so and so hospital or so and so location depending on the geographic uh, uh, geographic information whatever we collect and then that information when the person reaches the hospital that individual would match that hospital into the administration would match that individual's records and then they decide this is the person who responded the phone survey that's how then the back end is ai front end is the app and then if you see the pictorially initially you know we have a household house in a region and then we have individuals within the household see these are the individuals in the household and suppose say this is geographic region on which the survey has been conducted and then these are all the you know individuals within a household and then the they respond and then you see that here on the blue dots on the right hand side on this uh, particular region they are the individuals who have responded to a survey and uh, the yellow color circles indicate that those individuals are not been they have not been they never responded to the survey and then those who have not responded also some of them could be positive we don't know so we were only uh, getting information among those individuals who have responded to uh this uh, the app and then among them we can compute the probability of having a symptoms or probability of having the corona virus based on the symptoms they have so we could compute the conditional probability the ai model using the ai model data whatever data collection that is done we can compute the probability so this picture indicates that although some of the individuals have not responded for example so this individual this individual could be positive eventually could be positive we don't know 
and the positive among the responded people also there are positive cases among the non responded also there could be some positive cases if the response rate is high non response rate is low then the reliability or precision of the model would be higher if the non response rates are higher then the precision of the data could be i mean it's difficult to compute the precision so this is how the model works you know the this has been published in february in the uh, leading journal for the american society for hospital epidemiology the model and the data everything i mean the model and the theory has been published and uh, this is for example you know the theorem which been in the paper you know the details all the de technical details one can look at into the papers i'm not going the all the technical details but then the, the what the summary of this theorem is suppose there are n individuals in a region there are the probability that out of n individuals n1 have identified through the ai framework given that there are total small n number of individuals then the the probability of such e, such possibility is n1 multiplied by n by n square so this particular formula we don't have to prove every time if somebody comes with some survey data we can plug in that numbers into this particular formula in the theorem which is there in the paper then they can obtain a probability that what is the probability that an individual has been identified as corona given that the response has been done and then you know this received a wide attention you know this particular model of artificial intelligence for the corona virus received a wide attention because several industrial uh, partners software companies they all approached us to develop this into the system and uh, you know i saw some time back you know very nice talk by the our colleague from uh, Germany, Professor Carl Gorge, and also Professor uh, Kruger from Poland. You know, they gave fantastic talks. He was also mentioning about the apps and all these things. So I really, you know, uh, um, enjoyed their talks. So the one of that is, you know, they are also trying to develop the apps. So this is going to be very useful for the rest of the, you know, the epidemic or for the second wave. These sort of um, uh, trials. So the model, what we developed, the uh, coronavirus artificial intelligence model, received wide attention. For example, the Fast Company, you know, which is which is which covers a lot of news, and then Campus Technology also mentioned that you know they mentioned that the coronavirus app to provide at-home risk assessment based on the, our work, and then the leading newspaper in India, they also mentioned that an you know, app uses AI to promote to provide at-home assessment of coronavirus risk. and then also the other uh, leading uh, science writers they all covered this particular app because by the time we developed this ai model the usa number of cases in usa were only one one case was only there that time you know february only one reported cases and then these are the you know various innovators magazine various various other magazines including all the leading about 150 to 200 media outlets ac across the world they covered news on this particular ai model which will simplify the identification because everyone is in the quarantine people people cannot go into the streets so it is difficult to test the people when they are at home yeah and my second part of my talk is on the the corona virus uh, the under reporting uh, model and the model which we, we use we are, by using which we can com we computed the under reporting for the nine countries and the key collaborator in this project is steven kranz he is at washington university st louis yeah our major studies also this also we are also we published a couple of articles i think four articles we already published on this corona virus mathematical model that one came in the infection control hospital epidemiology other article came in the journal of theoretical biology another major article on india came on uh, current science which is leading uh, science journal and then the other articles are on the med archive and a few more also there on the which is which is are in, the, in making so let us see the under reporting of corona virus in nine countries before the first peak and that by the time we studied uh, this particular nine country data in the us they have they had only 500 cases in the beginning of march so what we use the differential equations sir type model and the wavelets we introduced the how to use wavelets to understand the magnitude of the true cases versus the reported cases this is a major article what that the complete detailed methodological developments 
published in the journal of theoretical biology in the month of march and then we applied that as soon as that article came in you know we applied that ideas on the wavelets along with the differential equations to understand the under reporting in nine countries these are the articles already i mentioned the idea was you know the actual pandemic preparedness depends on true cases we all know that the reported cases may not always tell the complete picture of a epidemic in a country or in a population because there are many individuals who have never been reported or never been tested as we show in the as we discussed in the ai model many individuals may not respond to the telephone survey or internet surveys similarly many individuals who are positive some of them may not even get tested but stay, they still may be spreading the disease so that's what you know actually the hypothesis is that actual pandemic preparedness depends on true cases in the population whether they are reported or not reported whether they are identified or not identified so initially the way we considered was as follows we considered the nine you know the china italy iran south korea france spain and germany usa and also you know by the time we finished that you know india only had 10 cases at the time but we still try to you know uh, give some insights on india that i will explain also so we considered case up to march 12th in these countries and uh, they were looking like that you know china 80000 that china was the highest number of uh, china reported highest number of coronavirus cases by the date and followed by italy and uh, these are the the arranged according to the magnitude of reported cases and then we considered you know the first uh, first peak the date range between the first peak in these countries you see that you know various countries have reported uh, uh, the first peaks in various other various different uh, time periods except us by then they didn't reach the peak they have only 874 cases they didn't reach the peak by then and then there are several other factors also considered one of that is uh, population density and other is the urbanization that means what fraction of people are living in the urban areas and then we discuss the daily new cases during this interval during this period daily new cases and the proportion of population within the age interval 0 to 14 15 to 64 and 65 plus and then based on the model and then the wavelets we found that in china the reported you know based if the wuhan data if we use the wuhan data whatever reported apply to the entire china based on all these factors like population density urbanization daily new new cases proportion of population combining the peak and then the density various uh, nine about nine factors we considered so considering all these things if you consider china you know they might have one one out of 149 cases to one out of 100 cases they might be reporting and italy one out of one in four by then you know and then uh, iran one in 34 i mean reported one out of 34 cases are been reported and uh, south korea one in four france one in five spain one in 53 germany one in three and us of course the data is insufficient by then so it is not reliable information one out of 406 so to demonstrate the impact of under reporting we have as i mentioned we use the wavelets and as we all know that wavelets are improvements over fourier transformations and then these wavelets or you know they can be localized by both time and uh, space and then out of all these countries three countries you know the we found that the whatever we predicted in the beginning of march they came out to be true by end of march in about 20 days before whatever we predicted that uh, that came out to be true in italy germany spain and also south korea also that came out to be true in a sense if you see the italy the predict you know the uh, the di- difference between the we already predicted the one one out of four only been reported and by end of march we saw that number of cases actually 
increased rapidly in Italy. And then uh, the Germany, you see the dotted lines and, uh, you know, in the beginning of March, if you see that based on whatever predicted, they also came out to be true. The Germany, you know, the data of Germany, you know, German uh, the, it tested a large number of uh, individuals. And although the magnitude of number of tested in USA is much higher than Germany, but then the, the fraction of uh, tested in Germany is much, I mean, higher than, I mean, uh, US. So Germany, you know, responded very well. And then we saw that, you know, by end of March, the number of cases in Germany did not show that growth, that many cases. And then same in Spain, you know, the Spain, the number of cases really picked up, you know, in 20 days uh, before whatever predicted, end of March, that it came out to be true. You know, Spain increased, the, they actually, the number of cases uh, dramatically increased in 20 days, of, in, in about 20 days of time. And then when we recalibrated our model in the middle of uh, March, uh, we found that, you know, although there are only 4,000 cases have been reported in the U.S. in the middle of March, there could have been 90,000 coronavirus cases. And then recently we have not published it. We back calculated the, the coronavirus uh, uh, possibility when actually the U.S., the community transmission might have occurred. We found that, you know, perhaps in the middle of December, the you know the transmission in the population start might have started occurred in the US. We don't know, but we are trying to, you know, we already have the raw data and then we try to fit the model, but we haven't published it. So already we see the middle of March there are about there were about ninety thousand cases were perhaps in the in the US. And this is how the reported versus the not reported cases of US look like. And then after the under-reporting study, we also conducted several other studies on impact of lockdown and hospitalizations. And then we provided a lot of time-to-time -time analysis. You know, I worked closely with the hospitals, various counties. I practically developed models for the several counties, consulted, you know, the, provided the peaks when each county could arrive the peak. And then also the state of Georgia, you know, we provided for the governor's office. Uh, they, when they approached us, you know, the, the Georgia cases, Georgia state of Georgia cases. Uh, and then the, we developed these, you know, hospitalizations. And this is my last slide. And then the uh, lower estimate, you know, we predicted the number of hospitalizations during April to June. This we provided in the beginning of April. We, we predicted a lower estimate of number of hospitalizations in the U.S., entire country. This is uh, in the entire U.S., there were 20,000 hospitalizations who are non-ICU, and then the 11,000 who are ICU. So in altogether 33,000 individuals who might be needing hospitalizations. And then the medium estimates uh, suggest that in three month period, there could be 60,000 individuals who need uh, non-ICU non admissions and 30,000 individuals who need ICU admissions. And as you see that, you know, the uh, we are reaching in the middle of June, the, immediate, the estimates, you know, the it is closely matching the hospitalization, closely matching the medium estimate. And this is a higher estimate, you know, the about uh, 270,000 versus 150,000. Higher estimate, I think the U.S. was successful in, you know, the maintaining the, the hospitalization between the medium to the higher estimate. And then, you know, as we know, this study also received a uh, wide, wide, uh, I know the various uh, within the U.S. and outside U.S. also they covered a lot of uh, uh, you know the news on this uh, how to how to adjust the underreporting in various countries and we also helped some of the we also uh, helped various other governments outside the U.S. in understanding the situation various uh, agencies when they approached us we also we are happy to provide a lot of timely analysis and then you know one of some of the you know the, uh, the india also they reported our study saying that india may be detecting one in four covid cases and then also the the economic times and the and also reported you know mathematical modeling helping the various uh, timely analysis and so on and then we are also uh, i'm also um, along with the two other uh, my colleagues in a, in a washington and then in spain we are editing a special volume a uh, special volume of the uh, journal, leading journal in mathematical analysis. We are, in, we, are getting, we are actually launching a special issue for the coronavirus and mathematical modeling. And then we just started the work on that. And then um, 
um, we'll be happy, you know, happy to see this special issue comes with a practically meaningful. We are not looking into just mathematical uh, developments of a take a model and do some mathematical work. No, we want to do some, we want to bring really interesting articles which have really, which are contributed for practical, uh, practically uh, meaningful uh, policy implications. Of course, they need to be mathematically rigorous articles, but need to also focus practically solvable solutions in the, in the real world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rao, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, there are some questions, but the first question is, I mean, the paper that you uh, indicated in the beginning, uh, that's available at the moment? I mean, it has been in print already? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, good. It came in February sometime, you know. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was one question maybe it should have been asked earlier during the talk, but uh, maybe you can explain still. What do you mean by dates range of first peak? Correct. That's a good question. You know? So this is the only study which considered that sort of analysis. That is, we considered number of cases when there are 10 or above. In a country, we reported 10 or above cases and then reaching the peak that means the number of cases started declining. The date from which the next day, the number of cases started declining. The first peak, first time, about 10 number of cases are beyond 10 to the number of cases when they start, when they start declining. First time, first peak. Okay. Uh, Thomas, this was your question. Are you, is the answer uh, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Uh, yeah, partly. The only thing I'm worried about is if you have this first peak as the first day when the numbers are re uh, declining again. I mean, since this is all stochastics, I mean that for one or two days, the numbers are declining. This can happen at any time without any particular importance. So that's why I was really surprised when I saw that the first peak in Germany was by uh, beginning of March, when we were far away from the from any peak, since yeah, this was still the piece of exponential growth. Absolutely, absolutely. See, we all know, we all agree that you know, when we started the coronavirus, we saw the media reports, we saw the how the various country leaders responded. They said, no, no, no it's fine, we won't get it. So that was the time, you know, the in the beginning of say middle of April, middle of February when the artificial intelligence model we developed, the number of cases in the Europe was so low, mm -hmm. and no one could expect expect that the number of cases would trigger to so many. And the USA only 800 cases are reported in the beginning of March, and the US never expected that that would be that would touch the two million number of cases. <laughs> yeah. So when we initially, that's the reason we considered the first peak, we believed the peak is peak. And uh, that's what happened, you know, you're right, you know, this is, so the first peak uh, of the data when we developed the model for Germany or various countries, you know, that just the first peak reported. That That is not the, uh, then then because the, the one out of three, if you see the Germany, particular to the Germany, one out of three reported, that means the two out of three are spreading the disease who are not being traced. Mm -hmm. So those two are spreading because what the, the one individual who are identified is quarantined. He or she is quarantined. That individual is quarantined. Other two are who are not identified. They are, they are still spreading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Which, Can you, uh, there's another question, or uh, please elaborate on the use of wavelets in your work. Maybe you can say a bit more. You already said something, of course, but. Sure. Wavelets are, you know, they use the trigonometric, uh, the sine cosine wavelets is a sine cosine function. And they are improvements over Laplace transformations. And these wavelets, you know, the initially, you know, they have been used in physics problems. And then we use the wavelets, which are localized, you know, lo wavelets are, you know, the localized functions. When we, in the class, you know, I teach in the complex analysis, I teach the other analysis courses. When I teach that, you know, we all know that, you know, the these functions are very flexible and we use the Myers wavelet. 
and then you know similar wavelets are also used uh, the our aim was to initially when we studied the wavelets in epidemics our aim was to use wavelets to compute the complete data from a partial data like reported is never complete because earlier you know in the music uh, you know the cd the, the dvds you know the lost data any data sometimes you know the music cds some of the data is scratched from the cds and the compact discs then the wavelets are used to complete the data complete information so the wavelets are known to provide you know information which are you know able to capture some information and then able to predict so we want to this first time we were successfully able to use the wavelets for epidemic under reporting and also that major article in the journal of theoretical biology where we explained the lot all the theoretical uh, components of the wavelets like uh, their improvements over the lab, you know the laplace transformations and all such things okay yeah sounds sounds natural and indeed uh, for uh, filling in the missing data yeah um yes. final, final question maybe uh, there's a question on uh, are there any differences between urban and rural regions yes this is a good point you know i really i see that the reason behind india's slow growth in the beginning and many other countries slow growth in the beginning days you know is because 64 percent of indian population lives in the rural areas Mm -hmm. and 35 percentage of the indian population lives in urban areas and then when urban population the migrants started returning back to home after the lockdown they carried the virus to the rural areas also which actually even today the 50 percent of the rural are protected but then the that actually played a major component in various countries in italy or other regions where the in usa majority or networking is very very high network of population urban areas yeah yeah so that's important component we considered yeah okay maybe maybe i should allow for one last question and it's by one of the panelists so maybe till would you like yeah. to ask your question yourself right it's a very short question i mean um for the app you mentioned at the beginning you developed um do you have for any region um information on how many users uh, how many people really downloaded the app and how large is the response rate among those who uh, installed the app Got it. this this is for the for the out, for the effective for the effectiveness of the app a key question i mean how large is the fraction of people really using these things okay in general you know the users of app is very very poor very poor you know they because uh general you know the i have been working uh, discussing with the people with the tobacco users they had developed the, you know they are having the ai models uh, not just for this sort of identification general response rate is very poor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for any apps in particular our app because it is gone it has gone to the fda you know we need to get an fda approval because this is related to health let things we cannot develop on our own to implement ourselves so currently the app is in the you know the it has to go through all the code everything once the coding is done fda need to clear it to be useful for the to be used on the population but general general app you know people use unless that comes to their own health general response rate using the apps is very app is not that good you know mm -hmm. thank you yeah, in the, in that context maybe thomas can you can you uh, uh, maybe react because i think in germany they launched an app yesterday is that is that true um yesterday there was a contact app lab, uh, launched in germany and i think by now it was downloaded already 2 million times um yeah well but the question is how many people will use it how many uh people will keep it on their mobile mm -hmm. and the problem is that this app since it uses the api which is provided by uh google for android and by apple um is restricted only to rather recent mobile phones or rather recent software versions so maybe lots of people that have a little bit older mobile phones cannot use it yeah. so therefore what will be the, the final outreach of that app is completely unclear and the other thing is in germany people are very uh particular about data security and privacy so 
that's the other big issue uh, how many people will actually use it yeah okay maybe I, can, maybe I can add a comment here because we have in poland the app now since 10 days essentially in mm -hmm. uh, on the market and um, up to now, it's a little bit less than 200,000 downloads, which is much, much less than Germany, um, despite the fact that the app keeps privacy very well. Um, so they did a good job on that. But there is a, a serious problem. The app announces, for instance, contacts only with a delay time of one day because they want not that you get a detection. You, now the app uh, sells, it tells, tells you you are a high-risk person and you're sitting to next to each other and that you can conclude that this person was infected. So they give you the information only with one day delay. And then um, you have to call a call center. Now the call center then decides whether you get tested. And only if you get the tested and the test is positive, you can activate the app to be visible for others that you are again an uh, infected person. And this is a long procedure. It takes at least three days at the moment, which diminishes the value of the app very much as I demonstrated in my talk. These delay times are really crucial. You have to shorten them. Okay, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, and Professor Rao, I would like to thank you again for your very nice talk. Thank you, Professor Schindler. Yes, and uh, I give the word now probably to Matti again for ending this uh, first day of the uh, of the webinar. Yes, thank you. And uh, my question to Danes is how many minutes do we have left now for the panel discussion? Open your microphone. Uh, we make uh, make a panel discussion tomorrow because I have to give it to the uh, <laughs> the thing to other people uh, this uh, Zoom. So uh, what I suggest you that you should give a final remark, uh, closing remark, and then uh, we can discuss tomorrow again. Yes, uh, okay. for the panel discussion. So you make a closing remark, and we will give it to them. Yeah. All right. So we okay. make. A, so we make a closing remarks because I have to give it. I have to give it to my because sir is asking me. Please, so close. Yeah, yeah. Close it, yes, sir. Please, yeah, please. Yeah, I request yeah. you. I request you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, sir, thank you, sir. Ah, sir, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. The only thing that I now leave for all of you to think about until tomorrow is what kind of uh, follow up from this event you would wish to have and what sort of international collaboration could be suggested as now a uh, communication between the different centers and different speakers and different talks. So, uh, so this is for tomorrow. And also I only thank for everyone uh, participating for the today's uh, discussion, the, uh, the, the speakers and the commentators and, and, and so forth. So thank you very much and until tomorrow. Okay, bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Patil.